In LASIK today, in a general speaking, we use the same technology that was used for ALK. In other words, a microkeratome is used to remove a section of the cornea, but instead of removing it, this section is hinged. And then instead of removing another piece of cornea or freeze drying anything, we use a laser to actually change the surface of the cornea. And that's the big development of the eczema lasers. The cornea is then replaced on top of the lasered area. The net result is all the the healing, the treatment is done underneath the surface, underneath this intact flap that is now placed on a hinge. So that's the basis of the modern LASIK procedure. We'll talk in a minute about newer technology that we use today, but you can see how it developed out of these older procedures, which developed out of Dr. Barakar's experimentations in South America back in the, in the 1940s. Modern LASIK today uses two different lasers to achieve the results that we saw in, this, in these earlier diagrams. Uh, the main advance in laser vision correction was the development of the eczema laser. The eczema laser is the laser that actually removes the, the, the reshapes the cornea by vaporizing segments of the corneal tissue. This is an eczema laser. It's a, it runs at 193 nanometers, so it's ultraviolet light. It uses argon fluoride gas in the, in the laser box. It's very compatible. This, this wavelength of laser is very compatible with, with water molecules, and I'll explain why that's important. This laser has a very broad range of treatments, so we can treat nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, etc. There is in this laser variable beam scanning and variable spot size and offset scanning. So there's ways to kind of titrate the, the, the look of the laser and the power of the laser to various parts of the cornea to really customize the procedure better for various types of corneal um, uh, pathologies that we see. There's eye tracking technology on these lasers, so the patient needs not worry about moving their eyes during surgery. The center, the laser is centrated and then tracked to the center. So even if the patient moves their eye a little bit, the laser follows that movement. That's the biggest fear that most patients have: is what? How can I ruin this operation by moving my eye? If you think about it, you'll see how big of a fear that can be. And so, what people often don't understand is that la laser wavelength is compatible with a specific tissue in the human body and acts on that tissue. For example, the eczema laser is very compatible with the coefficient of water. So you'll see that the coefficient of water very high here, and this is the wavelength, 193 nanometers of the eczema laser. So when the laser hits a water molecule, all of the energy goes into vaporizing that water molecule and none of that energy is transferred either deeper into the cornea or, or heat is transferred to the side of the cornea. None of those uh, effects happen. And the cornea, of course, is 99% water, the corneal tissue. So this, this laser only affects a very surface treatment. In fact, each pulse of the eczema laser vaporizes a quarter of a micron of human corneal tissue, which is less than a cell, less than a, than a human cell length. So all this treatment stays on the surface. Now, for example, we have other lasers, let's say blue-green lasers, which are compatible with hemoglobin, not water. So let's say you were a diabetic and you had a leaky blood vessel in the back of the eye. This laser would go right through the cornea, through the lens, through the vitreous, but when it hit blood, when it hit hemoglobin, it would cauterize that blood vessel. And similarly, we have lasers that are compatible with pigment, with, with, with uh, melanin. And so those lasers can affect a change in the pigment or seal up a hole or a tear in the cornea using the vaporization of the pigment. They don't affect the surface of the cornea at all. So it's, it's important to understand that the development of laser and the laser interaction with human tissue is strictly dependent upon the wavelength of the laser. So we know that these lasers affect water. So the, what, what the eczema laser does specifically is the ultraviolet light essentially breaks the bonds between mo molecules by vaporizing these molecules on a microscopic level. The number of pulses and the duration of those pulses have to do with how much tissue then is going to be vaporized and the location of those pulses as well. This, this slide is a slide of the eczema ablation on a human hair. That was, this was taken by IBM, which used to have the, uh, the patent on the eczema laser, just showing how accurate and reproducible the laser is in vaporizing human tissue. Today's laser is a very complicated uh, apparatus, and although the laser comes out in a, in a broad beam, the laser beam can be molded and homogenized and split and offset so that we can treat various parts of the cornea without having to move the beam around. And so these technologies have developed over time, allowing us to customize the treatments to various uh, human refractive conditions. In fact, the way we treat farsightedness, we said earlier that we treat farsightedness by steepening the cornea. 
when you steep in the cornea, just the way you would, you would steep in a snow cone by licking around the sides of the snow cone. So the way the cornea is steepened is by vaporizing the peripheral cornea, leaving the central cornea intact. That essentially steepens the curve of the, of the, of the cornea. And this is done with, in our laser with what's called offset translational scanning, which allows the laser beam to be split into two beams that then circle around the, the uh, periphery of the cornea, causing us to treat uh, farsightedness. And this is a, a tremendous advance for people who are farsighted.